Well, it is uh, it is an honor to be here uh, today. And so, I mean, if you spat today, I mean, it just ended up on your mask. So <laughs> I think you probably suffered more than I did there. But uh, anyway, Elmira is a great school too. And uh, we always have uh, Battle of the Barns and uh, it's, all, it's all good fun. <laughs> Anyway, yes, I, I did have the uh, honor and privilege of sharing with you uh, November the 8th. Uh, if you recall, November the 8th was a day similar to today. Uh, I went back home after that and had a small group meeting with a bunch of young adults. And uh, we sat outside in our lawn chairs and shorts and t-shirts. So it was very similar. So as I was driving uh, here today, I once again thank God for such wonderful weather to travel in. And uh, it's, a, it's an incredible honor to share with you today. Um, yeah, and, and it's interesting because I'm going to have an opportunity to... Uh, how many of you were there on that November the 8th when I last shared? Were there some of you that would have... Okay, um, so I will also give a little bit of background information because what's really neat is that I had no idea what God was up to in the midst of this interesting season we've all been in. But God has done something significant in my life, and I want to share that with you today. I had the privilege of sharing at my home church uh, last Sunday... And in sharing my testimony, I had a number of people come up to me afterwards and share that it was very encouraging for them and helpful. And uh, so that's my heart. Uh, anytime I have the opportunity to share, uh, you know, God's word and share testimony, uh, my prayer is that it's encouraging to the people who hear it. So uh, what an honor. How many of you uh, spent some time watching the Olympics uh, for a couple of weeks there? Anybody else like myself interested in uh, the, uh, the going on uh, events that were happening? I mean, I am an individual in particular. I love running. Now, a lot of people, they kind of are you okay, you know, and, and maybe think that I should go in for uh, some observation. But uh, I'm one of those interesting people who actually loves running. And uh, so as a result of that, uh, when it comes to track and field, so the second week of, uh, of the uh, Olympics taking place, I mean, I watched far too much Olympics, okay? <laughs> Way too much, I'll admit that. It's uh, time for some confession. But part of the reason for that, I don't know, depending on what you're into, maybe, uh, maybe you play guitar, and you watch someone who has mastered the guitar, and you're just in awe of what they've accomplished. Uh, maybe... Uh, you know, someone violin, maybe uh, you're into art, you go to a museum, and you look at a person's piece of art, and you're just in awe of that, and what they accomplished. Well, that's how I feel with running. When I watch someone run efficiently, very well, like again, all those Olympic runners, like I could just watch that for days on end. My friend and I, we go to um, Offset every single year, even if we have an athlete from Waterloo, Oxford, who actually made it there or not, we go. Because I, I just am fascinated by these incredible athletes. And so it was interesting because uh, last week as I was asked to speak at Wilmot Center, um, my responsibility was to look and we're going through the book of uh, Philippians and talking about joy and reasons that we have to have joy in our lives. And mine in particular was that there's joy having an eternal focus. And it's from Philippians 3. So if you have your Bibles, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start with this to catch you up to speed with where we're going today, okay? So Philippians 3, verses 13 to 14. Now, before this, Paul gives all these reasons why he was like a Jew of all Jews, right? I mean, he, uh, he was taught by the greatest rabbis. He, was, he had great zeal for the Jewish faith, all these things. But yet he goes on in verse uh, 11, uh, he says... Um, he says, and actually a little bit before that, he says, like, all of these things I now count as loss, okay? And he says, I want to know Christ, yes, to know the power of his resurrection and participation in his suffering, becoming like him in his death, and so somehow attaining to the resurrection from the dead. Not that I've already obtained all this, or have already arrived at my goal, but I press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. Brothers and sisters, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it, but one thing I do, forgetting is what, what is behind and straining toward what is ahead, I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. See, it was interesting because as I was given that text and I was asked to share from that joy and having an eternal uh, perspective, the reality is, is that as we watch those Olympians, I think part of also what really draws me in is the stories, right? You hear stories of individuals who overcame great adversity. 
to be able to accomplish their goal, right? As you watch them cross the line and they get a gold medal, a silver medal, a bronze. If you watch the marathon, just to finish a marathon in and of itself is an accomplishment, right? And so you understand that for these individuals, they could not have a perspective on just a given day. But they had to have their mindset on this event that was for many of them five years. At the beginning of the dream for many of them, it took five years for it to become a reality. And so similarly, Paul is saying, hey, let's focus, let's focus on the prize. As we run, right, I believe that uh, the, the metaphor of running a marathon is very much the metaphor for this Christian uh, life that we're to live, right? It isn't a sprint. It isn't done in just one day. It is this ongoing, and the reality, as someone who's run several marathons in my life, uh, at, towards the end of it, there is great endurance required. So last week, as I was sharing with uh, my home church, I made a couple of points, and I'm only going to focus on one of them today, but I'm going to give them to you, okay? So with these runners, okay, why did they do this? Why do they put themselves through all of this hard work, right? For five years, as an example, it's because they have their eyes and their mindset on the goal, and that is to win the race. Okay, so for these athletes, there are four things that we learn about athletes in order for them to have success. One is, and this is the one I'm going to focus on today, you've got to trust your coach. Okay, number two, you have to run your own race. Uh, some of the races where you saw, especially in the men's 400 meters, Kwame James, I was sure he was going to win. But the problem was, is that one of the other runners in the lane beside him went out way too fast. Everyone's like, this is impossible. There's no, he's going to keep this up. And Kwame James was watching what he did, and he went out too hard too. So here went a guy who I believe should have at least got silver, nothing less, with his ability. And the times he's run this year, he ended up not getting a medal because he tried to keep up with the guy in the lane beside him. Right? We have to run our own race, the, the race that God's called us to, right? We often get focused on other people. We wish we had it like them, or if only we had their gift, etc., right? That's the second point. Third point, we can't quit, <laughs> right? When it gets really difficult, it's really challenging. The 400 meters is a really difficult race. The first 300, they're almost sprinting, and then the last uh, 100 meters of that 400 meter race you can see it on their faces right they're stri they're straining and striving to get to that finish line we can't quit and then again we race for the prize we must remember the point of all of this the point of our following Jesus the point of walking in obedience the point of trusting him is to one day have him say well done Right? I, I remember finishing the Boston Marathon in 2013, and I had, for uh, 13 years, uh, I was, I was uh, working towards qualifying for that event because it's so difficult to do. And when they put that medal around my neck, it was like, that was all so worth it. It was all so worth it for us to have Jesus one day say, well done, good and faithful servant. Now, I'm going to go back to point one, trusting our coach. And now we are going to read the portion of Scripture that I have for today. And it's John 13, verses 1 through 8. So if you have your Bibles with you, it's interesting because in this text, Jesus knows his time has come, right? He is ready. He understands that he is going to be laying down his life on behalf of these men that he's invested three years with. And it says in verse 1, it was just before the Passover feast, Jesus knew that the time had come for him to leave this world and to go to the Father. Having loved his own who were in the world, he now showed them the full extent of his love. The evening meal was being served, and the devil had already prompted Judas Iscariot, son of Simon, to betray Jesus. Jesus knew that the Father had put all things un under his power, and that he had come from God, and was returning to God. So he got up from the meal, took off his outer clothing, and wrapped a towel around his waist. And after that, he poured water into a basin and began to wash his disciples' feet, drying them with the towel that was wrapped around him. And he came to Simon Peter who said to him, Lord, are you going to wash my feet? The reason he was incredulous in this moment is that that was not something the rabbi or the teacher would do. It would be the person in the lowest standing of the household would do this. So Simon Peter, of course, quick to speak his mind, right? <laughs> Simon Peter, you know, very passionate. You knew where, where he stood. And he says, seriously? 
Lord, you're not going to wash my feet. And Jesus replied, you do not realize now what I am doing, but later on you will understand. And then no, said Peter, you shall never wash my feet. And Jesus answered, unless I wash you, you have no part of me. And then in typical Simon, uh, Simon uh, response, he says, then not just my feet, but my hands and my head as well. If you're going to wash me, wash it all. <laughs> so we're just going to pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you for your word. God, I thank you that your word has power. I thank you, God, that it is alive. And Father, as I share from this particular text, and then also share, God, part of my journey, I pray in Jesus' name that this word of encouragement, Lord, would bless and encourage my dear brothers and sisters. Lord, you know each one of them. You know them intimately. Lord, you know as a congregation this time of transition they're in. But God, you also know each of their personal lives and things in their life that they're enduring right now. Things, God, that are causing them anxiety and stress. I have heard from so many people in this last year and a half about the amount of anxiety, uh, uncertainty. I've heard these words often. And so, God, I thank you that you do not leave us in that place, but that, God, you offer us words of encouragement. God, I pray that that would happen today. And, God, we give you all the praise and glory. In the mighty name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. And so it's interesting because when I came to that portion of scripture, I'd read it before. But when I got to verse 7 in particular, where Jesus says to Peter after he says, you're not going to wash my feet. No, no, <laughs> that's not your position. Let's go get a servant, right? In that moment, Jesus says something really important. He says, Peter, right now, you don't understand what I'm doing, but one day you will understand. See, that really stood out to me because in this past year and a half and a number of situations in my life in the last seven years, I have come to understand that there are times where we don't understand what God is doing. See, Proverbs 3, right, in verse uh, 4, 5, and 6, right, we understand. It says, trust the Lord your God with all of your heart and lean not on your own understanding. I don't know about you. But often my understanding or lack thereof causes me problems. <laughs> if I'm going to stumble, it's often because of my understanding and the lack thereof. Where I sit there and I think I should know what's going on. That God should make me privy to what he's up, up to. And what I've discovered is that when he doesn't, I have to do the faithful, I have to lean into him. So I'm going to share a bit of my own personal story and how God has really made this abundantly clear to me in my own life. I also want to uh, give us a picture today. How many of you have ever seen the movie Facing the Giants? Any of you seen the movie? Okay, so for those people who've seen the movie, when I say death crawl, you're going to understand what I'm talking about. The death crawl was something that the coach used about partway through the, or it was actually later in the movie. He was coaching a football team. They had had a good season, but now they're against the top ranked team, right? The, the chances of them beating this other team were not good. And the coach understood this. He understood that if his team came in with an idea or a thought that they had no chance against this team, they were going to end up fulfilling that. So he said to them, he said, how many of you think that we're going to beat this team? And they said, coach, like that's, that's impossible. He turned to one of his stronger team, uh, one of the players on the team, and he said, how far do you think you can do the death crawl? Now, all the death crawl is, is you're on your, your, your palms of your hands and the tips of your toes without touching your knees to the ground, and you put a player on your back. So you're kind of going along and making your way, right? And so he says to him, he says, how far do you think you'd do the death crawl? He said, coach, I think I, think I could probably do 30 yards. He thinks, he, the coach says, I, I believe you can do more than that. And, and he said, well, maybe, maybe 50 yards if no one's on my back. Coach says, you know what? I believe you can go further than that. Are you willing to do this? He says, yeah, I'll do it. He said, will you do your best? He says, yeah, I'll do my best. So then he puts a blindfold on him. And so this player gets down and begun, begins to do the death crawl. Okay? Now, he, he has a blindfold on, so he can't see how far he's gone. He has no idea how far he has gone. And the coach begins to encourage him as he begins to tire and so he says to him, he says, come on, you, you, you know, give me your best. You can do it. Come on, give me your best, your very best. One more, you know, you're almost there. And he's show, shouting all these encouragements to him. And at the end of the scene, this player has actually made it to the end zone. <laughs> he made it more than double what he believed was possible without a player on his back. I want to use that because I want to reference that later on. 
right? This whole metaphor of trusting the coach. For myself, the last seven years has been a big journey in the area of trust. See, when I came and I shared with you November the 8th, I shared with you that last summer I had met with a counselor because because of COVID and having my life ground to a halt, my life, my ideas, loving to work at a high school, right, feeling like I was living out my calling and having that stripped away, right? We've all had things stripped away because of COVID, right? This pandemic has stripped things away for all of us. But last summer I finally went to meet with a counselor because I was like, I'm having some issues, I'm really struggling to be content. I thought that's why I was going in. And I learned that some of my issues, a good part of my issues at that time, were things relating to my parents. Right? We had a rocky, I had a rocky past with my parents. And so I met with this counselor and I was like, you know what, I should probably do this again. But my counselor moved to Ottawa. <laughs> I'm like, oh, ain't that great? I finally met a guy that I feel like I can connect with and now he's gone. Oh, lovely. Okay. Now, November the 8th, at, at that point, I'd shared with you that God had me working at another church. I was working at Bethany uh, Missionary Church, and I was serving as their interim youth director. That ended up being a blessing in disguise. I had no idea, right? God opened that door. I'm sitting here going, God, I should be at WO. I should not be at this church. <laughs> but God knew what he was doing, right? As we all entered into various forms of lockdown, right? Right? This past winter, following up from last November, this past winter was horrible for me, right? As I sat there and I even shared with you guys the story of Yitzhak Perlman when I was here in November, a gentleman who was a top violinist, a string broke on his violin and he continues to play and he encourages us that, you know what, often in life we're, we're to, to find how to play our very best with what we have, right? And not to lament the one thing we're missing. So I knew that. And yet, this past winter was one of my hardest. I deal with seasonal affected, okay, disorder. In the best of winters, when I am at school and I'm doing things I love, I struggle. This one was harder than ever before. And I got to February, and uh, we have a, a, a large organizational uh, meeting for Youth Unlimited. It's called Today's Teens. It's where uh, youth leaders would come together, typically in person, but this year it was on, uh, online. And we came to that, and you know what? I was feeling really discouraged, and I was really down. And I came to that that day, and one of the sessions that they had was for individuals, uh, youth uh, workers, to become more proficient in using online resources. And I am not overly proficient in that area, so I was like, this will be good. I went on, the guy was uh, about... 24, young guy, he was, he was uh, in Hawaii, that's where his, <laughs> his feed was, and I was feeling a little jealous, right, his beautiful weather, etc. But after about five minutes, he shared, within five minutes, he shared what he had done, and then he opened it for questions. I'm like, this is pointless, I need something practical, I need someone to run through these ideas. So I left that session, went back to the virtual foyer, and I was scanning the various things. And one of them was about burnout in ministry and discouragement in ministry. And I'm like, well, I'm feeling really discouraged, so I'm going to go check this one out. I went on to that session, and it was a psychologist, a counselor, who was leading it. And they had just asked this question, saying, what are the signs of burnout? And was now reading the responses that people had given. And as they went through that, it was like, check, <laughs> check. Check, right? All of a sudden, I have this, uh, this realization that I was dealing with burnout. And I mean, I had burned out in my life before from doing way too many things, right? Not having proper boundaries, but this time, it was from not doing enough of the things that fill my cup. Do you understand what I'm saying? Those activities in our life, right, that just fill us up and we come away from so encouraged and refreshed. Those things were not happening, right? I was leading youth events on Zoom. A lot of the kids didn't even have their uh, cameras on, right? It was just like, is this getting through? Is this making a difference? There was very little personal interaction. One thing that the uh, pandemic has shown me is that I am an extrovert <laughs> to, to the furthest degree. And so I was in this moment. So I'm listening to this session. And this counselor continues on to say that she had worked in a high school like myself had worked there for 11 years, had great favor with staff, had opportunities in the school to care for and support young people. And a new administrator came to the school and within a week of that was removed from that position. 
Went from this place of having this job that they loved and being removed from it. As I'm listening, I'm like, this person probably gets how I feel right now. So after the session was done, again, a, a co-youth worker with Youth Unlimited in the GTA area, I reached out, I said, hey, would you be willing to meet with me? I just feel like I need someone to talk to, someone who understands how I feel presently because I'm struggling. Your session helped me to understand that I'm burnt out right now because of what I don't have in my life. So this person was incredibly gracious met with this person, shared how I was feeling. I said, then I asked this question. I went into that meeting going, I have to find out how this person came back from that. Because they shared that for three and a half years, okay, removed from that position, three and a half years they struggled. (laughs) And I was like, I have to ask them how they came back from that, right? Because I'm like, right now I'm hurting. This is so difficult. And so I asked that question, and it was interesting because what I learned is that this person was wired very similar to myself, very extroverted, (laughs) loved to be active, loved to serve people, right, always busy, and she said to me, she, she said, you know what, Jason, in this time, God took me to a deeper level of intimacy with him, and as soon as she said that, I'm like, cha-cha, you know, cha-ching, that's the answer. And so I I went from that, and I was encouraged, and I felt that it was time for me to go further into some more counseling. I needed to find another counselor. But I'll be honest with you, I put it off, (laughs) right? As a male, right, I know something's wrong with my body. It's like my wife says, hey, you should go see the doctor. Oh, that's pretty good. I'll be fine, right? Let's be honest. There's people chuckling, right? Come on, guys, let's be honest, right? There's a part of me that was putting it off. And if I'm honest with you, the reason I was putting off counseling is because if I could get someone to just open things up, I knew that I had challenges from my past. My past was very difficult. I went through a lot of challenging times. I was bullied for seven years, right? My mom gave birth to me just after she turned 17. There was a lot of challenges and issues from my past. And it was like, I felt like God was saying, now's the time to deal with it. Because see, even seven years ago, when I first went to Wilmot Center and started serving as their youth director, I went kicking and screaming. I did not want to go there. I had gone to Living Water Fellowship that I knew for 25 years. I was comfortable. I knew everyone. I knew the gig. (laughs) And so God took me into this place that was so uncomfortable. The first year, three different times, I was ready to resign. Three different times, I was ready to hand a resignation letter to the pastor because it was so stretching. The next event for myself, because I talked about this in seven years and how God needed to take a number of events to get me to a place where I was ready to let him do his work. The next event was one that was three years ago. I lost my very best friend, other than my wife, of course, and my family, right? But in terms of outside of my, my family, I lost my best friend from ALS. Okay, Craig, Pastor Craig would know that too. We were at Living Water together. Uh, when he began to become ill. And initially, he had gone on a missions trip. They thought maybe he got a parasite. He started having trouble speaking. Then uh, they thought maybe it was Lyme's disease. So he went through all kinds of uh, treatments, went to the States for treatments, you know, and finally they determined he was dealing with ALS. And I watched my dear friend, right? When he first had, had symptoms, he was younger than I am today. This is a larger-than-life, strong farming man, Right? And I watched him slowly just wither away. And I remember so many different times, and and Pastor Craig was there as well, where we would pray for him. And I believe with all of my heart that God would heal him. There wasn't an ounce of doubt in me. I've seen God do healings. I've seen God heal people. I've seen God move in impossible situations. So I'm like, this guy is a man of God. He, like in terms of, like he just, everywhere he went, he proclaimed God with his actions and also with his words. He was such a godly man. And I prayed and yet he died. And if I'm honest with you, that shook me. <laughs> This is a guy who I, you know, I remember organizing prayer walks around Waterloo, Oxford. We had prayer walks. We had as many as 100 people walking around that school, praying for God to break through, praying for God to move in the lives of these young people. And when that happened with the loss of my dear friend, I wasn't praying like I used to pray. 
Why do I share this? Because, see, the reality is, is we live in a broken world. We live in a fallen world. And we have times where God doesn't move in the way that we think He should. See, again, I want to remind you of that scripture. Trust the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. See, my understanding there began to impact my faith journey. My understanding and lack thereof was having a deep impact on me. As Jesus said to Peter, right now you don't understand, but one day you will understand. So now we're at this place and God's making it abundantly clear that I need to pursue some more counseling. And I put it off. And I put it off. I finished my interim position at, uh, at Bethany at the end of May. And then my wife and I, we went away. I had two weeks off which I really needed (laughs) what a year and then it was like now's the time and so I was praying I was like okay God so this other counselor that I really connected with has now left what do I do where do I go and God made it clear that the, the next steps for me was to meet again with this counselor this one who had led that session so I'd reached out and I said would you consider meeting with me again to which she said yes. And again, generally speaking, I encourage girls to go with female, you know, females to go with females and males to males. But as we began this counseling, it, it, it makes sense. <laughs> this individual is very much wired like me, has my kind of personality. And something that's really important to me is to feel that the person understands me. That's really important to me. And so anyway, so I began to meet with this individual. The first thing we did was a genogram. And in a genogram, you you draw out the generations that have come before. We started with my grandparents. And the part that was uh, significant with that exercise is that I realized the only person from my grandparents to uh, my sister and myself, the only person I was truly ever close to was my grandfather. and He died just before I turned 13. Right? I knew that things were bad in my head, but see, sometimes when we, and actually more than sometimes, actually there's power in confession. James 5 makes it abundantly clear, right? It talks about, uh, is there anyone that needs healing, right? Therefore, confess your sins. I was reading that the one time and God was showing me it's not just our sins, it's the impact of the sins of others in our lives. Confess then so that you may be healed. So that was that session. And then my last session three weeks ago, before we started, and again, this is a follower of Jesus Christ. Every time we met, we always prayed beforehand and we asked God to lead our time, which he did. But in this particular time, after praying, she said to me, you know what? I believe that God wants to go back to your childhood. There's things in your childhood, just the bit I've heard from you. There's things from your childhood that need healing. So I said, okay, it sounds good. So she asked me, she said, I want you to share with me your earliest memories. And most of my earliest memories were actually not bad. We lived in Kitchener up until I was four and a half. My sister was born when I was three and a half. I remember dealing with some jealousy. It's pretty typical of firstborns, right? You get all the attention, all of a sudden a cute little sister comes along. It's like, oh man, you know? So I remember some of that. But then... um, there were two specific things that I know were traumatic, right? It's so crazy. I'm almost 50. (laughs) And even though I knew these parts of my story, I never thought of the fact that they could be traumatic and that these traumas undealt with, right, unresolved, impacted my life. It's never too late. And so anyway, so then we went and I said to her, I said, when I was a a really small child, and I remember this, this is pre-four, I used to get croup. Some of you may have heard of croup. It's an issue where you struggle breathing, right? I was born two months premature. One of the last things to form properly is your lungs. I believe that was part of the reason why I had a lot of lung issues and challenges as a child. But I would get croup, and I remember waking up in the middle of the night not being able to breathe. If you've ever had the experience of not being able to breathe in your life, you know it is very, very traumatic. Especially for someone who's under four years of age. My parents would take me to the hospital, and I remember being in an oxygen tent. I remember this this oxygen tent. It was really confined. It was really small. And I remember that. The second thing is my parents used to drop me off at a local church for Sunday school. And again, this was all before four and a half. And every single week, I would scream and cry because I was terrified my parents were going to come get me at the end. Now, you might wonder, you know, did they lose you at one time? Did you get separated from your parents? And I'm like, no. 
I know where that came from. See, my mom, like I said, gave birth to me just shy, just after turning 17. My uncles and aunts, she had 13, she was part of 13 in her family. My uncles and aunts all shared with her, you're too young. You should not keep this child. You should give him up for adoption. I know that that's why I had so much fear as a child of being left alone, of being given up, of being abandoned. (laughs) So those two things we both prayed. And we said, God, we pray that you would give Jason the ability, give him a revelation of where you were in those two traumatic events. And it was awesome. (laughs) Because in the first one, I saw myself in that in that um, oxygen tent. And, you know, if you imagine that this is my head, Jesus is standing right here. And the look that was on his face, right? If you've ever seen someone, right? I see a little one over here, right? I remember, you know, and I have three daughters, but I still remember, and every one of my daughters, amazing. I love them all. They're phenomenal, okay? But I remember my first, right? Everybody remembers the first time you welcome, right? It's like my life changed, (laughs) I thought I knew how to love people before that, but all of a sudden when I'm holding my own flesh and blood, I would have died for her in that moment, man. Like, it, right? Like it was crazy. And the look that was on my face, or the look that I see on a mother looking at her child, right? That's the look I saw in Jesus' face, right? He was just standing there. He was watching me, and I knew that he loved me. That when it seemed like there was no one there and I was on my own, he was there. Second one with this whole thing of waiting for my parents to come and pick me up. I was standing with Jesus. It was like we're standing at a bus stop. And I had him by the hand. And again, same look. Just, man, oh man, did he ever love me. (laughs) It was undeniable how much he loved me. So we finished that. Then she said, Jason, last time we met, you shared that you were born two months premature. Remember, I'm almost 50. I've always known this part of my story, that I was born two months premature, and the first month of my life I spent in the hospital. You do not need to be a psychologist or a counselor to understand that is not a good way to start a life. That's not ideal. They didn't have Ronald McDonald House. They didn't have Sick Kids Hospital. So my parents, every single night, and th- th- they couldn't do anything different, but they had to leave me there by myself. A little tiny baby just starting off in life left by himself so she said jason you shared that with me and i feel like god wants to heal that trauma from your past so once again we prayed and it was awesome jesus you know, you see the, those little kind of plexiglass, little containers they put the child in, right? Jesus, his lips were right by mirrors. I didn't hear what he said, but I knew he was assuring me. And he was just, just like this. And what is crazy is I've had challenges, right? I'm pretty, you know, things are challenging with my parents. There, there's some estrangement taking place. Things have been really, really difficult through the years. And as, I, as, as we, I had that revelation, in that moment, as I had that revelation, my counselor didn't bring up anything, didn't share this. But in that moment, all of a sudden, I found myself, the frustration and the anger I had had with my parents, it was going. It was subsiding. It was replaced with uh, an empathy for my parents, with the sympathy for my parents. See, both of my parents were born in, in families of 13, They were both towards the end of 13 kids. I have three children, and I love them dearly. But there are times where I feel like I don't even have enough time for three kids. I don't have enough time to invest in them and love them in ways that I want to. I can't imagine having 13 children. I understand and recognize the fact that my parents didn't receive a whole lot growing up. And so when it came my time, right, they gave what little they had received. They did their best, and it's crazy because all of a sudden I am, you know, my heart's changing, and I'm, I'm giving up the resentment and the frustration and the anger, and in the time that I've had since, I realize that there were times when my parents supported me, my parents cared for me, my parents loved me, but I couldn't see it because I had this distorted lens. Powerful. 
See, the reality is, in this season, I have talked with countless individuals. And after I shared my story on the Sunday, I am, I've, I've had so many people reach out and share with me that they're going through similar difficult things. Whether it's something that didn't go the way that they anticipated, like the loss of Brunel in my life. Whether they're recognizing in this time where all of us have had our lives put on hold, where, where we're finally, <laughs> you know, having to sit still to slow down our schedules, people are becoming aware of deeper things. And see, the reality is, in my life, I was a diminisher. I would diminish what I went through. Even when I was bullied, I'd say, oh, it's not so bad. Oh, it's okay. It's not a big deal. You know, someone would say, oh, you're a loser. Yeah, I know. I'm working hard at it, right? Like, come on. <laughs> That's not the way to do life. I would diminish, I would suppress. I was a part of uh, Alpha Marriage, and, and one of the biggest things that they shared in that is that when we bury an emotion, we bury it alive. One of the most profound things that I have heard in terms of experiencing healing in our lives. Because see, this past week I had the opportunity to share with a group of children. I was at the Plattsville Day Camp. And I was sharing with these kids, and the one day I shared about my story of being bullied. One of the little girls, I, I'm just figuring she's six or seven, puts up her hand after I shared about how hard that was for me. And she says to me, she says, you know what? I really miss my house. When I was four years of age, we had to move from our house, and I really loved it. And she said, you know what? My mom told me that I didn't really have any friends there, but I did, right? We do this. I can just imagine, right? The mom's trying to help her daughter and say, well, you know, you weren't really connected there. You didn't really have any friends. The reality is, is all of us in our lives have had these moments, and I don't know about you. Maybe you have faced them. Maybe you've stopped suppressing. Maybe you don't diminish. But if you found yourself struggling at different seasons in your life, I'm here to share that there is hope. <laughs> and I don't care what age you are. I still remember at Woman Center when I was still serving there, I had a 70 probably three-year-old man, in my office weeping with me because he was sharing things that his father had said to him. And we prayed that day. And I believe that God brought healing to him in that specific area. Right? Man, I am so thankful. I'm thankful in the first case that God called me to Wilmot Center. I didn't understand that. I'm like, God, why would you do that? I love it at Living Water. I get this gig. It's because of his love. When I lost my dear friend, was it that God took him away? No, we live in a fallen world. Sin has brought brokenness. It's brought disease. But praise God that through that situation of losing my best friend, I started to recognize that I needed help. And then last but not least, this season, when, man, I learned that we were going to be experiencing COVID and going through the pandemic, and I couldn't be at this school that I love so much and doing this job that I'm so passionate about. That was the final thing that made me face and begin to see the things that I had suppressed so far and pushed down, right? Almost 50 years of age. Even with a trauma like that in my life, I had no clue. I had no idea. So I don't know where you're at today, right? Maybe you have had a number of situations in your life and you are still reeling from that. Maybe you're struggling in terms of faith. Even this morning as I had my quiet time, I sensed to even encourage you as a congregation, right? As you're in this position, you're in this transition, that God is for you, right? When the Israelites, when Moses, their trusted leader for 40 years, right? They trusted him. They'd grown to know him and to love him. When God brought around about a transition for them, the new transition, this Joshua was one that had them cross the Jordan to go into a land of promise. And I felt as I was praying this morning to encourage you and to call forth faith to rise. Because the enemy does not play nice. And he'll dangle things. What if? Now what? How are we going to accomplish this? How is this going to take place? And my encouragement for you today is trust the coach. You do not know right now what he is doing, but one day you will understand. Heavenly Father, I thank you for this opportunity this morning to share your word and to share your heart. 
Jesus, you make it abundantly clear that your purpose in Isaiah 61 was to bring healing to broken hearts, to set captives free, to restore sight to the blind. I thank you, Jesus, that that mandate is for today as well. Lord, you know each and every individual who is sitting here this morning, and God, I don't believe in coincidence at all. That Samaritan woman, as she was there to get some water, she came with what she thought was going to be her reality, and yet she met you, Jesus, and her life was forever changed. Lord, you know each person here. God, you know their past. Lord, you know their experiences. And so, God, I pray if there's anyone here that recognized today that there's something that they need to deal with, that, God, they would not be afraid That like Peter, who's sitting in his comfortable boat, that which he knew, he was willing to step out on the water because he knew Jesus was the one who was calling him. Before I responded and reached out to the counselor, man, I had all kinds of reservations. I was like, this is too much. I don't know how to get there, God. I don't know how to get healed. And God, you spoke to my heart and said, that's okay, Jason, because I do. (laughs) So Lord, I pray that, Father, today, as each of us have heard your voice, God, may we not harden our hearts. God, I pray that today would be a day of victory. Lord, I pray that today would be a day of healing. And, Lord, I speak over this congregation that faith would rise in each heart. Jesus, you are the author and the perfecter of our faith. I thank you, Lord, that you work all things together for good, for those who love you, and are called according to your good purposes. And Lord, that is the word for this church. God, you are working things together for their good. And right now they may not understand, but one day they will understand. So Lord, I pray now for the word that you've imparted into each heart. I pray that you'd seal it by your Holy Spirit. And Lord, I pray that my brothers and sisters would rise up in faith and that God, as they hear your voice, they would leave the comfortable boat, to step into what you have before them. In Jesus' mighty name we pray.